<laughs> and that's the uh, standards lab, but Pete's going to show us around the working lab. Aren't All right, you, Pete? This, this is our, our laboratory, our, our general, general laboratory and, and service area. Um, it's an electrostatic safe, safe area. Safe uh, so area. we have an electrostatic floor that's, that's grounded and, and requires electrostatic protection. So I'll ask Dave to keep his hands in his pockets and not touch any gear as we go. I won't touch anything, I'll just sniff it. All right. <laughs> and there's probably there's probably a couple of reasons why we need Dave to keep his hands in his pockets. Right. Uh, and that's and there's a tester you stand on that. That's yeah. an ESD. Normally it's norm, normal ESD procedure. So right. in here we're broken up broken up into probably three three areas, three and a bit areas. Mm -hmm. um, we've got our automated calibration area uh, where we put a high volume of, of equipment through automated procedures. Um, again, there's standard procedures that are, that, um, are maintained globally. Um, as we, on top of that, uh, we have our manual cal area where we do cal procedures that need a little bit more operator intervention right. and uh, a little bit more skill from our, from our calibration engineers. It's a, sort of a progression path to go from automated to, to uh, manual cals to developing your own cal procedures. When we develop cal procedures, um, they have to be uh, validated mm -hmm. by a metrology team. Our metrologists are super guys. Yep. Um, being one out, one out of three, I know you're one guys. of the three me uh, key metrology guys here. So we, and um, you were telling me you have to get your reaccredited every four yeah, years. Yeah, as part of part of your accreditation, uh, you, you basically have to reset your entire trade every four years. Wow. Um, so it's um, it gives our, our customers a bit of confidence level on us, I suppose. Yeah. Quality uh, quality is hard to maintain. If you do it properly, um, if you also do it properly, it's 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 a benefit to everybody concerned. We take shortcuts. We right. we spend about two, nearly two full time headcount devoted to quality and metrology across our organisation. Fantastic. So, so we're going to go for a tour. Show us each uh, individual. So here's here's one of our automated areas here. Um, yep. You can see in the background we've, we've got a, 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 a computer controlled system um, that drives all our reference equipment. In this case um, this is a, a low frequency station um, so that we can test a device under test to a validated procedure. Right. All right. It's important that it's not only our test equipment is traceable but it's mm -hmm. also important that it's done to a validated procedure, procedure. Yes. Uh, and we validate globally. When, when our manual guys develop a procedure for a multi-vendor box or even, even uh, an old box that isn't necessarily uh, currently uh, sold, we have to publish it and we publish it globally. Right. All right? It's, uh, it's, we don't keep secrets within our organisation. If, uh, if you can't afford to have someone look over your shoulder, you've picked the wrong trade. The wrong All right? trade. So we, everything we do is audited and audited to bull. And when we publish globally, Agilent's a fairly fair-sized company. You can imagine if we publish a web-based a web-based tool that, that demonstrates our procedures, every te Agilent technician and engineer on the planet has got access to it. And if you make a mistake, they're going to tell you about it. They're going to tell you about it. They don't miss a trick. No. And what are these two racks here? More automated yes, stations? Yes, this is a higher frequency station. It's All a right. microwave station. Um, so microwave signal generators uh, will go through here, counters, uh, spectrum analyzers, uh, up to 50 gigahertz. Uh, this is uh, an older station. We've got an old 8348 there. So it, as a standalone station, it would only go to 26 and a half gig. Only. Um, okay. We would drag in a PSG uh, or a 83650 into to extend the range to 50 gigahertz as needed. And what's involved in Calibrating or calibration verifying a spectrum analyzer, a typical spectrum analyzer. You how to, much? You, how many hours? Okay, you a, a spect, through an automated procedure, calibrating a spectrum analyzer to the OEM, OEM uh, procedure would probably take, depending on the frequency range, um, because the the frequency the the IF functions are common, but the frequency range extends your frequency response tests, uh, your your uh, noise tests, your residual test extends it. So a, a three gig spectrum analyzer might take you three hours to do on an automated system. A 26 and a half gig analyzer might take you 
four or five hours, depending on the on the model and, and the options. Doing it manually, doing the same one manually, um, it's the same level of testing, can take you eight or nine hours. And these can spit out automated reports? And yes, uh, our, yep. um, our, reports, our reports and certificates are generated so that they, um, we can give a customer a, a hard copy mm -hmm. or a soft copy. Our soft copies are our, our records and they're, pu they're published globally and audited regionally. So our regional auditors come through and tell us that um, you've missed something on, your, on, your, on a certificate. They'll, they'll pick, pick a fault pick it, yep. uh, under a system called Lighthouse that, that tells us that um, the associated time-based report from this device is missing. Where is it? And if you can't find it, you have to recall the box. Got Just it. an example of something that might happen. So that's all there, yeah, all that report information and certificate information, the phase noise test, the time-based tests, uh, the, the measurement report and the certificate and the uncertainty analysis is all available online to us and to our customers. Yep. All right, so that begs the question, if your supplier's charging you $100, two hundred dollars <laughs> yeah. to generate a report what's he actually charging you for to print out a copy of a PDF document that he should already have I'll leave that one for you Dave all right next and here's a whole bunch of gear this is all uh... some old stuff um, some current stuff um, the, this is uh, general purpose test equipment it's right. still calibrated oh all right uh, uh, okay so this isn't customer stuff this no, is no, this, this is, is lab this, this is all this, lab gear this is lab gear that's that's <laughs> left over some of it's uh, not in use uh, you'll, you'll you'll be able to tell the stuff is not in use because it's got got a, normally got a sticker on it yep. all right a, a quarantine sticker so it, it's not a calibrated item calibration we even not, not we even we even calibrate power supplies believe it or not yep so it's, yes. it's no it's yeah yeah some people need their power supplies well, calibrated it's, it's, well it's, it's, well they they want to yeah, well it's it's part of the standard. If you're doing if you're doing switching systems yep. um, for for data and the like, uh, a switchable power supply and, and load uh, uh, generally match for it. So, yep. here's part of our manual cal area. Uh, we have uh, we have a, a, a pretty competent team here. We've got uh, three people that operate our manual cal area, mm -hmm. experienced calibration engineers. We've got another station here that's a, a semi semi yep. semi automated station um, where we do some particular um, precise measurements. So we do some more precise measurements in this area than we do in the automated area. Um, traceability paths the same. Uh, certainties are similar. Okay. So, uh, but this is more manual. This is more for for an item globally. We, we don't generate a um, an automated procedure uh, across the planet for any item that there's less than a hundred of. So if, if, if we start seeing a, uh, a multi, what we call a multi-vendor box, is a box that's made by another manufacturer, if customers start to ask us to do that, mm -hmm. uh, we'll make a decision whether we're going to do it whether or not, it's worthwhile. whether it's worthwhile. And in most cases, it, we'll do it, yep. um, but uh, we're su supporting a customer's box, a competitor's box, so we're going to charge it a little bit more for exactly. it. Inevitably, um, they, the small volume of competitor's boxes we see per model number, uh, they become manual cows. So this is where, where the manual cal comes manual into it. So we manu happens. manually do it. Yep. If you um, if you can't do a measurement manually that you can do on an, an automated system, then there's something wrong. Right. All right. You have yeah, to, yeah. It's, it's still an analog analog uh -huh. universe. All right. And this is all old school GPIB controlled. Yes. Um, yeah, mostly. 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 We also do um, we also do LAN for right. the some LAN stuff, the LAN stuff. Yeah. So the, the field foxes uh, are, can be calibrated either end. For example, uh, and their their the reference equipment is all run by GPIB. Yep. The device under test is controlled by the LAN cable. So and what's this little nook? This little nook oh, here is a power voltage. supply. Warning, folks. Yeah. Ta-da! High voltage test area. All right. So this is this is this area is devoted to testing um, power supplies. And can they've thrown some LCR in here out of the blue? But um, these two racks here are. are, are Totally devoted to AC and DC power supplies and loads. Um, so we test the, we test the loads uh, f for uh, under full load mm -hmm. uh, and test the power supplies under full load. We test them for things like uh, RF RF noise up to 20 megahertz on top of the DC. Right. Uh, we yeah. test we test them for RMS and peak peak noise. Cool. We test them for transient response time. 
between full load and half load. So yep. we switch the we switch the load at a kilohertz rate mm -hmm. on and off between full load and half load, and check the response and time of the power supply. And you can check the response supply. time of the power yeah, supply. It's it's a, it's any, a, any good power supply is going to be spec'd for, for that's response exactly time right. and for noise, usually up to that's 20 megahertz. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, so, so that's uh, that, that's a sort of thing. It's not just a matter when you do a power supply. It's not just a matter no. of hooking <laughs> a multimeter across and saying yes, you've got 24 volts. Yeah, um, that's that's uh, items awaiting uh, quite acceptance. Oh, okay. Or repair parts. Right. All right, we have an optical area here where we we do uh, optical, testing. optical testing. So we do essentially we do in fiber measurements. Multi-mode and, and single-mode fibres, wavelength, optical power, optical attenuation. Um, again, it's a traceable, traceable calibration, um, and covered by a quality system. Is there much call for fibre? Not a lot. Product testing? Not a no? lot. Um, it's the RF, the RF side of, of the industry tends to uh, be more focused on on quality and traceability. Uh, there is less. There is less uh, less demand in the optical side um, for that sort of work. And we come around to our repair area. Our repair our repair area is um, run by um, two uh, competent engineers. Uh, it's it's led by Mr. Luke Kinchewski, who is our repair manager, and there he's. He is. Uh, and his <laughs> lovely assistant, Joanne Un, Hello. who's a repair engineer. So these guys, these guys do right. probably uh, how many? How many different product numbers did you say, Luke? Uh, about 120. 120, 120 different products different that we support, products. that we do repair repairs in Australia over the last year. Uh, year to year and a half. Yeah, so 100 different model numbers, not just different units, different model numbers. Uh, is there any particular type of instrument that fails more than? Others? No do particular you, instrument? Like as in, do scopes fail more than multimeters? Do power supplies fail more than... Uh... You'll find that a lot of multimeters may fail because it's just the nature of the instrument. They've actually abused it. And Correct. Yeah. yeah, it's a portable yeah. device, gets dropped, gets damaged, uh, yeah. gets not abused, but you know, one wrong measurement and bang. Yeah. There, there is no time frame for you to correct the mistake. You just make that mistake and you know it's wrong. What happens to a network anal network analyzer when you put 1600 watts on the front end of it? Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> it tends to charcoal. We had a, right. we, we had a customer who put um, who managed to put 1600 watts in the front of a uh, 8753 ES. In front of us. How in front did they of us. Do that? Um, because the person setting it up didn't actually know what he was doing. <laughs> we, no we, we stood back with our hands in our pockets and uh, <laughs> looked, at each other. looked at each other and said, "This isn't this isn't right." But uh, when they tried to claim, claim warranty on it, we said, ah, oh, no. no. <laughs> Not going to happen. Go around to our phase noise area again. What about our lead-free? Oh, lead-free station. Yeah. Luke, you want to do the introduction on the lead-free station? Go on, Pete, you can do it. All right, we've, um, yeah. across uh, in, yeah. in uh, the US and in Europe now that uh, rail has compliance is becoming more and more important. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're starting to see that in Australia. I don't think the legislation is... Uh, uh, has is likely to come in the short term in Australia, but in the long term we'll probably, uh, as a manufacturer, if we want to be a manufacturing base and we want to be able to sell to the US and Europe, we're going to have to comply. So it's rail has compliance is removal of hazardous substances, yes. uh, things like lead. So it's a lead-free soldering station. Even the tools are isolated here. We can't you, we can't take a set of pliers or side cutters from here and go use it on leaded solder. And then, um, and then bring them back here because we're going to contaminate the lead-free um, station. So it's a different type of soldering, uh, yep. the lead soldering. For those of us uh, that did high reliability hand soldering as part of our trade, um, you always aim for a shiny joint. Joining, you you yep. always cleaned it off with flux removers and everything uh -huh. else. And you know, when you inspected it with a, you were, were looking for a perfectly mirror, mirror finish as a best finish. With the lead-free soldering station, if you looked at it under the same conditions, every every joint looks like it's a frosted joint. That's it. Because it, you're not using a eutectic point, you're not using flux remover, yep. uh, and that, that that same sort of technique. So that's gone by the wayside with the Rojas compliance. Um, 
fortunately, I don't do that stuff anymore, uh, which is which is good. When when Lukey needs a hand, um, and I offer to give him a hand and go and give him a hand with the repairs, he normally hand, hands me a broom. Excellent. No, it's not not quite. I, I normally fit parts for him. So yeah. So now we'll go around to our phase noise area. So, oh, of course it's locked. I won't, I won't unlock it. You've seen no, it's, it's similar to the phase noise system that we use in the TARDIS, except it has a higher frequency range. This, um, this allows us to go to 26 and a half gig directly, without using the external mixers, um, and and down to the normal normal frequency range of um, low frequency down to 10, 2 mega. Uh, the only difference is we're using a different FFT. Uh, it gives us a much better dynamic range than a normal DDA converter. Um, which gives us a lower noise floor, close in in particular. Right, so that's, that's that baby. Very nice. Is it Agilent's policy to develop state-of-the-art, uh, you know, gear that can be used in calibration labs? Because ev almost every bit of gear you've got here is Agilent. Yeah, it is. It is. If you look at um, the the reference signal generator here. Um, think back to the old days when you had the 8662A and the 8663A, which were the industry standards for phase noise mm -hmm. across the planet. They were the industry standard. So we now have this one here, which is the E8663D, which is developed particularly for the low frequency, low phase noise performance on it. Right. All right. And in the, at the low frequency end, uh, where residual phase noise, not absolute phase noise, residual phase, phase noise, that's where, you, where the time bases have to be tied. Right. The problem with absolute phase noise is that as you get close in, and, and uh, we're talking 3 hertz to 200 millihertz offset from the carrier, mm -hmm. nice and close, um, if you're using a phase lock loop system, any instability of your device under test within that phase lock loop is lost within the phase lock loop. Yep. So when, when, we speci when we specify residual phase noise, the time base of the device under test and the reference oscillator are locked. Mm -hmm. So any instability of the device under test actually shows up in that residual measurement. Got it. It's a much tighter method than absolute or a phase lock loop method, mm -hmm. and it shows the inherent stability of the two devices. In the case of, of this one here, um, at low frequencies, it's actually got a divider built into it. So at low frequencies, you can switch in a divider, and which uh, mathematically gives you 6 dB better phase noise because Ooh, you divide the signal. Okay. Got it. All right, so yep. automatically, and because you're not harmonically mixing that lower frequency band, you're, you're, you're dividing it, you probably get another 3 dB benefit because you're not going through that, that um, heterodyne mixer to get the lower frequency. Nice. So effectively you get around about 9 dB in practice, about 9 dB uh, better performance on those, those lower frequency phase noise things. Fantastic. Particularly for radar sites, it's, it's, it's critically important. Uh, if you've got a, got a radar signal that's going X kilometres away and yeah. coming back, your phase, no your phase noise and um, noise figure all add up to, to determine what the dynamic range of your radar system is. So that's why it's, that's why it's particularly important for those guys. Is that where most of your, most of the stuff, you, most of the call for equipment, calibrated equipment comes from? Is sort um, of the in, a, in, a, in, Australia of in, a, in Australia, defence is certainly large, yep. large interest to us. We don't want to go into too much detail no. about we, what we do or, or, or where we go, but it is significant for us. Uh, but we also have significant manufacturers as well associated with it. So some of those people that you met this morning are some of our um, uh, significant manufacturers in Australia. Terrific. And we support those people directly. Is that it? That's pretty much it. We're back to we're back to the unstable atomic clock. <laughs> so this is where most general purpose gear is calibrated yep. as opposed to the standards lab which is the stand yeah that's that's for really the standards lab is for um, for the low frequency standards, the thermal voltage converters, um, the DC cells, uh, um, resistance standards, um, our precision multimeters like the 3458, uh, our gold, uh, tested against our gold standards. Our, the calibrators that we, we use uh, get calibrated in there, as we discussed yesterday. 
and uh, the only other thing, it's, it's in there more for isolation uh, than necessity that our, our S parameters and sensor system um, is in there as well. So it's, uh, and they're accredited differently, the two no, labs? It's the, no, it's, it's, the, it's the one accreditation. accreditation. It's the one accreditation. Right. So. Got it. Thank yeah. you very much, Pete. Beautiful.